No? No song? Well, open your Bibles, if you would, to Acts chapter number 9. <clears throat> good to have you with us tonight, and if you're joining online, it's good to have you there. I was thinking, as I was thinking about those who listen online, we got a letter from uh, one of our missionaries in China, and uh, he said, and he's talking about a seventh grader, uh, a boy that got saved, and that all this virus there had, had hurt their church attendance quite a bit, and they had been preaching online. And he says this, and I, I want you to uh, remember it if you would. Um, let me find it real quickly. He said, with that being said, please pray that our online services will not prompt any form of investigation or reprisals from the government. And uh, sometimes we forget, as I mentioned this morning, we forget how blessed we are. And uh, wouldn't it be bad to be afraid? And as a matter of fact, their church has had the government from China come in on it before and, uh, and go to the house of, of the pastor and sit and inqu inquire several things about, uh, about issues. And, and so... Need to remember that. And also I was thinking about when we were singing uh, how we're safe with Jesus. Uh, and uh, the Piedmont Rescue Mission, there, the man who's overseeing it is Tony uh, uh, Honeycutt. And he, he was evidently in missions in Africa. And uh, he was talking about they'd had a couple men saved in the mission and they... They have several different missions there, ministries. They have one where they deal with a lot of drug and alcohol addiction. Then they have a, a pregnancy service in which they rescue women that's going to have abortions. And they, they try to help their families uh, with their babies. And, and said that they had five babies this month, had two men that were saved. And uh, his wife was, gave a testimony and said that the, the men had joined a choir there, and they were singing, he's got the whole world in his hands. And she said, I was thinking about that when they were in Africa, and Tony, that's her husband, fell down a 60-foot well and said, I was looking, and all of a sudden he disappeared and said that she ran over there screaming. She said to the top of her lungs, and all she could think was she lost him when she heard a faint voice says, I'm okay. And she said, it joy filled my heart to know that God had protected him, was holding him in the palm of his hands. And, uh, and I'm thankful that uh, they said that they were able to uh, put several families back together that was going to, uh, that had been separated and was going to have abortions, and yet they were able to do that. And, you know, we have many missionaries, and uh, right now... Uh, we're not taking up our, our little mission offering like we normally do with the kids going from pew to pew. Uh, but we still need to remember our missionaries and, and we need to remember all the different missions that we help support and remember those who are, we're seeing a, a, a lot of people saved a lot more in foreign lands than we are in our homeland right now. And we need to pray much about that. Acts chapter number nine, if you would. Begin reading in verse 1. Keep your Bibles open if you would. I'd like to go through Acts in a few places and look at a couple things if you would. And Saul, now remember Saul is Paul before he got saved. And so Saul here at this time was an unsaved man. Now we remember Saul, once he did get saved, he began and God had a a work for him as an as a apostle to the Gentiles. He was able to go to all the known world at that time. He was able to preach and establish churches, establish more churches than any other apostle did. He also uh, wrote, we know, 13 epistles and probably 14 epistles if he wrote Hebrews. And so therefore we 
have him as very prominent in the Bible. You read his message and you think, my, what a man. But you know, uh, he, he measures up, in my mind, as one of the greatest Christians that I've read about or I've known uh, in the Bible or that I've ever known. I mean, the man suffered persecutions. And when you read and see what all he went through, and uh, sometime if you've never read that, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 22 through 28, you ought to go read and see how many times he was jailed, how many times he was whipped, shipwrecked, beaten, uh, uh, and uh, stoned, left for dead, and all kinds of issues. He had issues, uh, and everywhere he went, he had dangers of people robbing and stealing and and, and uh, against him, and, and of course he also, everywhere he went, he would rile up the Jews where he would go, and they would, they would try to persecute him. And, and so when you think of Paul, you think of what a godly man, and what a soldier for Christ. But now we're reading about him as Saul. So let's go back again. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest. And desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that he found any of this way, whether they be men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined around about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth, and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Now the pricks, prick is an is a ox goad, a, a long stick with a point in it that they would prog the ox along with. And uh, he said that it's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembling, astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Let's go to the Lord in word of prayer, if you would. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessings upon the reading of the word. Lord, we pray that you would help us glean something from the scripture tonight, that we may be able to see something that may be a help to us, and may be a help to others as well. Lord, we thank you for the Apostle Paul. We thank you, Lord, that uh, uh, he did such a work and laid such a foundation that many of us Gentiles are able to rejoice today and claim to be part of the family of God because of churches that he established and because of the gospel that he spread that eventually got into the land where we were. And Heavenly Father, help us to carry on that great commission that you laid before him, that we would preach the gospel to all lands and to all creatures. And Lord, that they, we may see some saved. We pray tonight, before we get into the message, that you would be with our missionaries. And Heavenly Father, be with each and every one of them. They all have needs. They're all dealing with all kinds of issues. And besides the virus, they're dealing with many other issues in their life. And we do pray, dear Heavenly Father, that you'd put your uh, 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 safety arms around them and build that hedge and keep them safe, dear Heavenly Father, in the midst of danger and trouble. And dear Heavenly Father, we lay them at the throne of grace. And not only them, but all missionaries, Lord, throughout the land, that's preaching, dear Heavenly Father, the truth and trying to see people one to our Lord Jesus Christ. Go with us tonight. We thank you for those who have gathered. And again, dear Heavenly Father, help us as we get into the Word of God. Give us, uh, give us something, Lord, that would be a help to us. We ask in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. Look in your Bibles just a moment, thinking about Saul and realizing that even though he turned into such a Christian as Paul, there was a time before that that he wasn't. And I want you to look back in your Bible in chapter 7 and, and turn with me to a couple places uh, in your Bible. In chapter 7, remember that the Stephen was one of the uh, first that was killed, martyrs that was killed of the church. Uh, he, he, was, um, he was a deacon in verse number eight, eight, uh, 58. Uh, Paul was, or Saul was there. And cast it, the Bible says, and cast him out of the city, talking about Stephen, and stoned him, and the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. So what they did was they took, brought Stephen out, they laid him at his feet, 
And so Saul would have the job of consenting to kill him or allowing him to live. Now look on if you would in chapter 8. In chapter 8 and verse 1, And Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time there was great persecution against the church, which was at uh, uh, Jerusalem, and they were scattered abroad uh, throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Now, before I read on, let me say this. As Saul consented to the death of, of, of Stephen, some people says, why would God let somebody like Stephen be stoned to death? Well, number one, you don't have to be threatened with heaven. And those that God took at a young age, as a matter of fact, like uh, John the Baptist. John the Baptist was 33 years old, and he was taken on to heaven. Uh, and uh, he said himself, he must decrease, and Jesus must increase. And so God had a purpose for him, and when he fulfilled his purpose, God took him home. But listen, John the Baptist didn't suffer uh, because he was taken out of this life early and taken up to heaven. I would say just the contrary. Uh, I would say that he was blessed to be able to take out of the persecution and all the issues. And remember, uh, he died by having his head cut off. And remember, Herod had his head cut off because he told him the truth about him taking his brother's wife and other issues as well. But anyway, getting back to this, uh, you need to understand that God had a purpose in allowing persecution to come upon the church. Now remember, the church waiting for the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Holy Spirit to come to empower the church, they were sitting there in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 1, 120 of them waiting for uh, the promise of the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit came and it moved upon them and Peter preached, there was 3,000 people added to the church. Then there was others added to the church daily, and that church began to grow. Some people estimated that it had about 50,000 people. But the commission that Jesus left them with was to preach the gospel at Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the othermost parts of the world. And so what happened was everybody was gathered at Jerusalem. And even though it was a big church and a large church, it was necessary that they would do, be spread out and take the commission of the spreading of the gospel as Jesus had left it. And you know what happened? When persecution began to come upon the church, then uh, what happened was some went to Judea, some went to Samaria, and some went on to the uttermost parts of the world. And Paul was one of those. But at the time... Uh, God was allowing Saul to persecute the church, and also he allowed him consent to death of Stephen. Not only that, but look in verse 3 of chapter 8. And for Saul, he made havoc of the church. Now, uh, havoc means that he continually created issues and problems uh, for the church. He said, entering into every house and hailing men and women committed them to prison. In other words, he would haul them off to prison. And now picture this. As a matter of fact, you could just picture how he would go into a house and he would have his soldiers, because he had the authority of the government, he'd have his soldiers to grab uh, those people, drag them out, men and women, their children left behind, crying and begging and pleading. And uh, he did it all because he hated the name of Jesus. He hated the gospel of Jesus. He hated the resurrection uh, of Jesus, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And therefore, he sought to destroy anyone that was preaching uh, uh, about Jesus. Then if you look on in verse uh, chapter 9, we read in verse 1, look again. And the Bible said there he was breathing out threatenings and slaughters against the disciples uh, of the Lord, and he went into the high priest. In other words, he was trying to threaten. You know, I was thinking about uh, uh, all this movement that we have in this country right now. Uh, the man and his wife trying to defend their house when they broke through the gate and they come up on the property and so forth. And they're trying to, trying to come. They've come and confiscated the gun, all this stuff. And what they're trying to do, the, uh, they're trying to intimidate anyone from standing. I'm going to tell you something. When this country gets where it quits standing... And we allow that bunch to run over us. 
uh, we're going to be in sad, sad shape. And we better stand, we better vote, we better do the things we need to do while we're here alive in this country. But getting back to here, but notice this and picture this. How Saul would go in, he would threaten and even murder. And, and verse 2, the Bible says, and he desired letter, uh, of him letters of Damascus to the synagogues that he... Uh, found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. In other words, he wanted to bring them in prison. Now keep your finger again in chapter 9 and go with me chapter 26. Chapter 26, we find him, Paul standing before King Agrippa. And again, he goes and he, he looks back upon his life before he got saved. And he makes a couple statements. Look in verse 9. He said, I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Verse 10, which thing I also did in Jerusalem and many of the saints that I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priest, and when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. In verse 11, and I punished them oft in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. In other words, he he compelled them to deny Jesus. And when they wouldn't deny Jesus, then he would take and he would persecute them. And he would compel them to blaspheme, being exceedingly mad against them. I persecuted them even unto strange cities. Now, think about this, if you would, about this man named Saul. Think of what kind of image he had among the Christians, the early church. What do you think the early church had to say about Saul? I'm sure they heard about him because he would go into homes and I'm sure they would hide and see him dragging some people out of one home and they would talk about this man Saul. They probably hated Saul. I wonder how many of them ever prayed for Saul. I wonder how many of them ever thought that Saul could possibly be saved. I wonder how many people thought that he was beyond hope when they would see his actions and how that he would go and he would, uh, he would uh, consent to murder and cause people to blaspheme and throw them in prison and split families up. Now think about that a moment. You know, we have that song sometimes that we sing, uh, uh, wrote by John Newton, uh, Amazing Grace. People thought that he was a hopeless case. He was a drunkard. He was uh, not only a drunkard, but he was a mean drunkard. He was a slave trader. He was, he was a type that people would say, there's no hope for that man. He was so mean and so cruel. But when God saved his soul, he wrote that song, Amazing Grace, and he would go into churches, and they would be astounded at what the grace of God could do to a man and how the grace of God could change a man. I was reading about a, a guy, I believe his name was Henry Miller. I can't remember for sure, but I believe that was his name. He was a Baptist preacher in Pennsylvania during the Revolutionary War. And, uh, and he had this one guy there close to his church that just created havoc to his church all the time. And he was a thorn in his side, and he was, he was mean to, to uh, 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 the preacher, and he's mean to his church, and he did everything he could do to try to create problems for the church. But then he was convicted, this man, uh, not Henry Miller, but the, uh, the other man that created such problems, he was convicted, best I remember the story, he was convicted because of his, uh, as a traitor. And he had to go before George Washington, or he went to prison, and, and he was sentenced to death. And so the preacher walked 70 miles, 70 miles. And he went before George Washington, and he asked him to give him a pardon. And George Washington said, I'm not going to pardon your friend because of his grievances. And he said, no, Mr. President. He said, he's not my friend. He's my worst enemy. And George Washington was so moved, he said, in that case, I'm going to show grace and I'm going to pardon and give them pardon. Sometimes you think that people is beyond reach. Some of you may have someone that you've been praying for 
And you may have quit praying for them because it doesn't seem like they're being moved. But no one's beyond reach. We don't need to give up. We don't need to think anybody is hopeless. We don't need to think anybody is, is beyond the ability for God to save them. The grace of God reaches down. The Bible says where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. I, I can understand where Saul, when he was converted and saved, where he, uh, he found himself before God, and he would think about all those times. How many of you, how many of you uh, uh, think back about things that you've done before you got saved? And maybe even you've gotten out of the will of God and you look back at things that you've done and it just, it just causes you such pain to think about those things. But you know, the grace of God is a wonderful thing. Paul recognized what he was and I imagine many times uh, he was in tears as he would pray for people and have such love and compassion. As a matter of fact, he said for Israel, he said that he would be willing uh, uh, to, to uh, uh, I forget the word, I can't think of it right now, uh, but he would be willing uh, 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 to, uh, Brother Eric, you, you know the word I'm trying to think about? Be cursed, thank you. Uh, be cursed for Israel's sake. And, uh, and he was willing to, to be cast aside and go to hell for Israel's sake. If Israel could just be saved. He had such compassion to see people get saved. And I think of, of how that his past life must have played upon him because he said, I'm chiefest of all Sinners. I don't know about you, but I felt that way at times. You know, I really believe the closer we get to God, the more we see ourselves, the more we see, the larger our sins become. When you see people that doesn't have any compassion or uh, doesn't have any regret of anything they've ever done, uh, then there's, there's issues there. But let's look back just a moment. Saul was a hard case. As we saw, he was very, he was very uh, uh, instrumental in going against and persecuting the church. Turn with me, if you would, in Philippians chapter number 3. And he talks about how that he was relying upon his own uh, uh, works. He thought that because he was such a good Jew and religious man, he thought that that was going to Reap him rewards in heaven. And let me say this, if you're here tonight or if you're listening to me, and if you think that your works or that you're better than someone else so therefore it's going to gain you position in heaven, Saul was a lost man. If he died in his condition, he would have went to hell. And to be honest with you, his works and what he did and the way he conducted himself as a Jew, thinking that he was under law, was probably far above what any of us could do in keeping the law. But notice what he says in, in Philippians chapter number 3, in verse number 4. He said, Though I might have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath wherewith of, uh, of that he might trust in the flesh, I more. In other words, he said, if you think that you're such a good person and you found favor with God, I was in better position than you are to think that. Look in verse 5. He said, I was circumcised. Now remember, speaking as a Jew in the law, circumcised the eighth day, the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. In other words, he said, I thought myself that I, had, I was working my way to heaven and that God was going to accept me and be pleased with me because I was working my way to heaven. Well, he was on, look back if you would in verse number nine again, and notice that he was on his merry way to continue what he was doing. Now, God will let you continue doing certain things in your life, but there comes a time when, and I really believe this, I believe that when the Bible says whosoever will, I believe that not only whosoever will can be saved, but I believe everyone gets an opportunity to be saved. Some way, somehow, God reaches and speaks to every soul. 
I don't believe, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm contrary to, to the belief of what some people teach us, uh, that there are some people that are born and destined and predestined to be saved, and some people predestined to be lost. I believe that every man has a choice. He has a will. I believe that God comes to him at some given or her at some given time, and they have a choice. Now here we find that as he was going on the road to Damascus, I remember one guy told me one time, he, uh, he kept coming to the altar, and he never could get any satisfaction. And he told me that he was waiting for God and praying that God would shed a light on him like he did Saul. Well, that's not the way God works. God works to each one of us differently. Now, Brother Jim was telling me uh, this morning that he is celebrating in two days. He is celebrating his 62nd birthday of being born again. 67th, I'm sorry, 67. And he is going back to the mountains over eastern Kentucky where he was saved. And tomorrow he is going back, Lord will, to the very spot where he got saved. And before he gets to reflect upon that and to think about where the Lord saved him. Now Saul, and I want you to look back and I want you to think about this a moment. And I want every one of you, young people and adults as well, to listen to me. And I want to ask you a couple questions here in a moment. And I want you to ask yourself. Notice if you would, back in, in chapter 9, in, in, in uh, uh, verse number 3 and 4, we find that as he journeyed, that God confronted him. Now listen to me. How many of you have ever been confronted by God? I'm talking about where God spoke to you. You knew he was speaking to you, and you could feel him speaking to you and dealing with you. Now, the Bible teaches us, if we're going to be saved, that no man can come unto God except the Spirit draw him. You have to be drawn. And I, I really believe this because I've had several situations in my life where I've been called to people at their deathbed, and the family wants me to some way miraculously see them saved. I've seen some that went out weeping and crying. I had one man over in Nancy. And I went to his bed, and he was fixing to die within just hours. As a matter of fact, he died within two hours of the time that I, I was with him. And he told me this. He began to weep, and I was talking to him about the Lord, and I was sharing with him the gospel, and I was, I was telling him. And he looked at me, and he said, Preacher, there was a time in my life when God dealt with me to be saved. He said, I'm fixing to die and go into eternity. And I'm going to hell. I can't feel his tugging. I can't feel his drawing anymore. He never speaks to me. He never confronts me. And I pray. But to be honest with you, sometimes you pray. And you just don't have any peace. You done that, Brother Eric? Been at the bedside of someone and you're wanting so earnestly to see them saved, but the more you try to pray, the less peace that God gives you about praying. It's like God says, he, he passed. He neglected. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? You say, oh, preacher, don't you believe that God can save anybody anytime? Absolutely. Anywhere? Absolutely. Anyone? Absolutely. But I also believe there's times when people, they reject and harden their heart. And therefore, when it comes time, you can't drum up salvation. You have to be drawn to come to the Lord. How many of you remember when the Lord drew you? Now, those of you, and there's some here that may say, Preacher, I'm not sure about my salvation. Well, let me ask you this. And I have, I have parents sometimes with children, small children. They say, my child's been talking and asking questions about a heaven and hell, about being saved and, and about Jesus. Will you talk to them? I say, yeah, I'll talk to them. But what I do is this. I take them back and I talk to them, 
and I, I try to explain to them certain things about the Bible, but I always tell them this, eventually. You'll have to, when, you, when it's time for you to come and be saved, there will be a drawing power that you'll feel God drawing your heart and bidding you and speaking to you about being saved. Now, I could take any child here, and I could take uh, uh, Lakeland. He's not uh, much of a child. He's growing up pretty big. I could take Lakeland and bring him down here, and I could make Lakeland say, I say, now, Lakeland, say this after me. Pray this prayer after me. And you'd probably pray it after me if I told you to, wouldn't you, Lakeland? But see, that would not save him. And I tell you what, we do grave injustice when we, when we uh, uh, try to consent people into salvation by having them to follow us in words of prayer. Now, if it's from their heart and if the Holy Spirit's drawing them, that's one thing. And, and I believe that. And I believe that where salvation is possible, and somebody said, uh, are you against soul? Absolutely not. As a matter of fact, I preached at a church one time that was pretty Calvinistic, and I didn't know it. And I preached, and, and they, they, they didn't believe in giving invitations because they, they were consenting that whoever was going to be saved was going to be saved, whoever wasn't wasn't going to be saved. And so... Uh, the pastor where I was going to church, I told him where I was going to go preach, and he laughed. I said, what are you laughing about? He said, I'll tell you when you get back. And so I went and preached, and Chris was there with me that day, and uh, I went and preached on soul winning. That's what I was preaching on. And so I preached this. I, I had this message prepared for soul winning, and I preached, and I preached my heart out. And I noticed everybody looking at each other in the church. And I was preaching, and I was preaching, and and uh, then I, it come time for invitation. I said, would you all mind coming and, and giving an invitation? And no one moved. Then it began to dawn on me. I, I was thick, but I wasn't that thick. It began to dawn on me what was going on. So I preached another 15 minutes. And I began to preach upon things because I knew what was going on. And I began to preach about the, the, uh, the, the fact that God allows everyone whosoever will that will come to be saved. Then I asked for an invitation. They about ran up there and gave an invitation. But I didn't, I, they didn't do it for the invitation. They didn't get rid of me, I think. But the point is, uh, the point being is this. You can't talk somebody in to being saved. They have to have a confrontation with God. God has to come and draw them. Do I believe that, that uh, uh, you can be saved uh, at your house by someone trying to sow? Absolutely. Uh, Darling's husband, Jackie, he's not here tonight, but he was here this morning. Saved him right at his chair. Remember that? When we got in the living room floor, went and talked to him, and, and right in his living room floor, he got on his face and, uh, and, uh, and called out to the Lord to save him, and right from his uh, living room. Can people be saved? Absolutely. Uh, should we sow win? Absolutely. But... What I want you to understand is it has to have the drawing of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit must be drawing. And, and, and there must be uh, that drawing because he will confront you with his Holy Spirit. And if you'll notice, there'll be a conviction of the Holy Spirit. Look, if you would, in verse 5. And he said, uh, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the, uh, the pricks. In other words, he let uh, Saul know that he was fighting against him. He wasn't fighting against the church. He wasn't fighting against these Christians. He was fighting against the Lord himself. And when it come time for us to be saved, and in time when we're dealing with our salvation, we must not only have a confrontation of God, but I believe he brings a conviction. That's why the Bible says, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. And somebody said, well, what's repentance? Repentance is when you recognize yourself as a sinner. You recognize the fact that you can't save yourself. You recognize the fact that the way that you've been going in life is, is wrong, and you have to turn to God to save you. And so when you turn to the Lord and trust in him and you turn from yourself, uh, you repent, of your sins and you repent of yourselves and you recognize the fact that you're a sinner before God. God saves sinners. He came to save sinners. 
And so therefore, you have to be able to get yourself in a position of a sinner. You know why that we are having such difficulty in seeing people saved today? We can't get them lost. It's hard to convince somebody that they're lost anymore. Everybody's got excuses, and no people who don't want to hear it, and they've heard this, and they compare themselves with this, or they know somebody over here, they know somebody else over there, and they use those things to elevate themselves before God. And therefore, they don't recognize that their works can't do it. So as Saul, we must not only have a confrontation with God, there must be a conviction that's wrought into our heart. How many of you remember whenever the Holy Spirit of God dealt with you? And then all of a sudden you felt yourself and you didn't have to ask anybody if you were lost. You knew you were lost and you knew you needed to be saved because you had that conviction. Amen? And so then what he did was he come and he recognized him as Lord. He said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And so therefore, people asked me this before. They said, preacher, when and how is a person saved? Now, you might disagree with me, but it's okay, but I'll ask you to prove me wrong. I believe that when the Spirit of God confronts you, and I believe that when he convicts you, I believe that at that point in time, and what happens is, we have a, we have a triune a, a being. We have a body, soul, and spirit. And I believe through the body, we have certain things that, that helps us in being able to receive the gospel. We have ears to hear. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We have eyes to see. Of course, we have the other senses. But by those gates that we have in our body, we get the message of God in there. And when we, get, when we hear, it goes into our soul. Our soul is a place where we reason things out. Our intellect, our, our, our affection, our memory, all those type of things is our soul. We weigh those things out and we get it in our head that Jesus is the Son of God. He died on the cross of Calvary. Most everybody you meet here in this church would tell you at any given time that that's true. But you've got to get it beyond here and you've got to believe it in your heart. With the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And so therefore what we do is we get to a point where we believe and we weigh it out and I believe at that point in time when we're convinced that the Bible is true and the Holy Spirit has convicted us that our will is the only thing that stands out of the way of God having his will in our life. And at the point in time when through our faith we surrender our will unto God, he saves us. I was standing back at the back seat in Sinking Creek Baptist Church the night when I got saved. And God was dealing with me and I sat there and I, I knew that I was lost and I was so convicted and I was being drawn. And somebody said, well, did you get up there and pray with the preacher? I'm going to be honest with you. I believe from the time I surrendered my heart in that pew and stepped out and I said, I'm going to be, Lord, I need to be saved. Save me. And I believe that he saved my soul. I believe by the time I got down here, I was praying because I'd, I'd been saved. Somebody said, well, I think you ought, everybody's got to, to come down and, and, and have a prayer. Listen, it's faith that brings salvation. Amen. Believing in your heart that brings salvation. And what happened was Saul, here on the road to Damascus, he was not only confronted, he was not only convicted, but he also came to a point where he recognized the fact that he was willing to confess him as Lord. He knew who he was. And there was a time when you had to come and somebody said, well, do you really believe that you have to recognize Jesus as Lord? Well, show me where it talks about being saved that it doesn't mention the Lord. Whosoever shall believe upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
You've got to recognize that he's able to do something for you. You've got to be able to recognize that he's able to save you. Amen? And so therefore, and he's able to do something for you that you can't do for yourself. If you could do it for yourself, why did he even come? And so therefore, here he comes, and he, he uh, uh, comes and he confesses before the Lord. Now, let me ask you this. Everybody know, needs to know where, when, and how you were saved. Now, I ask everybody to listen to me, and I don't want you to raise your hand, but I want to ask you this tonight. Even you young people, I want you to listen. Do you know, have you, is that, can you go back to a time and a place? But Jim, I'm going to pick on you tonight. Where is that place at? And where was it at there? So you have a spot, huh? <laughs> you know why? He knows where he was. I got the privilege uh, a few years ago, uh, several different times I've got to preach here at Sinking Creek Baptist Church. Each time I preached there, I went and I stood right here. I said, I walked down that aisle, and I said, I surrendered my heart. And I said, I got down here, and right here is where I gave God thanks for saving my soul. And I was able to go to the place. Now listen to me. Can you, I'm talking you. You means each one of you individual. Can you go to a time and place when you were confronted, convicted, you was willing to confess, and you was willing to admit and come and ask the Lord to save you? And you believed in your heart that he was able to save you. And you go to a place and say, Brother Billy, that is a time and place where I know for a fact that I gave my heart to the Lord. How many of you can go back to that place tonight? You know where you got saved. Some of you might not. I believe every saved individual. And by the way, there's one more thing to add to that with Saul and our clothes. There was a change. I never saw an example in the Bible where someone got saved and there wasn't a change. This idea of coming and confessing and walking out and being the same person you was when you walked out and never having a change is not taught in Scripture. Does that mean that you're going you're gonna to not sin and you're not ever going to fall, fall or you're never going to have issues? No. But it means that you have been given a divine nature. The Holy Spirit of God has made a, a home in your body. Your body is now the temple of God. You are sealed with that Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. You will never ever again, once you've been saved and born again, you will never ever again be without God's presence in your heart and life. Doesn't mean that you can't sin, but you can't sin without the Holy Spirit. And therefore, we have his presence with us. And so, let me ask you tonight. Are you saved? I really believe the time is drawing nigh. Somebody said, man, said, Brother Junior was talking about all this knowledge, all these chips and computers and all this stuff. You all may think that it's just normal. I think it's getting ready for something. Somebody said, well, they can't make us wear masks. They can't make us do this. They... All they do is say you can't buy and sell nothing if you don't. And you either do or you don't. So what happens, and, and by the way, just to make a point, there's nothing wrong with wearing masks. Feel free to do that. They're at both sides and get all you want and use all you want to. Feel free to do that. But what I'm trying to get at is this. Somebody said, well, they won't control me and they won't control my money. They'll control you. 
Did you notice how quick the world has stopped because of this virus? How quick they shut everything down? And how life could change for us forever because of this? When it comes time and God says it's time, He'll perform exactly what he performs. But what I'm trying to get across to you tonight is this, if you're not saved. It's getting close. And number one, you don't know when death may find you. But number two, you don't know when the Lord's coming. And you better be ready. Do you have that time and place where you can go back and say, Preacher, right there. If I were to ask you to stand tonight, could you say, right there is where I got saved. I hope that you do. Maybe you don't. And so tonight as we stand, sing, give the invitation. Maybe God is dealing with you. Maybe you've been confronted by God and God has spoken.